This is a Xerox 6085 Professional Workstation, also known as the Daybreak. It was introduced in 1985 and is the second generation of office automation computing hardware that Xerox produced. Uh, this is a uh, somewhat hard to find system. It's also rather large with a big striking 19 inch monitor. For comparison, this is a Mac SE. Before we delve into the software side, let's take a closer look at the hardware. This system was designed to be as easily serviced by the customer as possible. So unlike the Star, all of the uh, circuit boards on this just slide into a chassis with a single back plane. There's no additional ribbon cables or any other nonsense. So going from left to right we have the display processor card, the memory expansion board, the Mesa processor board, the uh, what is this, the input, uh, input output board, and then my system has the PC emulation board. Of course, being a Xerox system, this has Ethernet, they invented it. There is a sliding lock and the uh, uh, AUI transceiver will come disconnected. Uh, I have to wonder if Xerox invented this type of uh, locking tab. All of the connectors on the Star and many on the Alto use this same design. Uh, on the Daybreak it's only the Ethernet connector. Here you can see the detail on these connectors a little bit more. This one is for the keyboard. Um, the keyboard plugs into the base of the monitor and there, the, the speaker is also in the base of the monitor. There's no electronics fortunately this is just a uh, just a pass through and then this is the connection up to the floppy drive. This might look like kind of a normal uh, what is it 36 pin connector. Uh, IBM used this too on the external floppy on the um, XT but of course it is different because on this system the power comes separately and this is the power connector plugs right into the power supply and is held in place with some squeezy tabs. Uh, the display power is passed through the power supply and the outlet is switched by the uh, switch on the front of the machine so that's convenient. The monitor itself has no power switch. On all of these cards the uh, screws are actually jack screws so uh, when you loosen them it actually forces the card out of the back, back plane. Let's take a look at the, uh, at the Mesa processor. You can see now it's ejecting the card and they just slide out. This is the Mesa processor board here we have uh, 4K and another 4K uh, for a total of 8K of fast RAM. This is called the control store and it holds the microcode which stitches these four 8 megahertz AM2901 4-bit bit slice processors together into a custom 16-bit processor which can natively execute MESA, the programming language that Xerox developed and what was used to program the environment on this system. Um, these custom ASICs here, that takes a lot of the uh, many 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 chips that were on the the STAR system and condenses them down into a single piece of ceramic and silicon. Uh, you can see there is a large uh, backplane connector 
here. We'll take a look at the actual back plane in a moment. Let's take a look at the uh, I.O. processor board. Again, jack screws pull it out evenly. Uh, now on this board, right here, is an Intel 80186. And if you notice, there are two backplane connectors. The system has two separate buses. They call it the Mesa bus and the 186 bus. 186 bus is smaller and slower and is used for peripheral I.O. and it's also what the PC emulation board hangs off of. Um, on this system, the Daybreak system, the uh, disk I.O. is offloaded to this 186 processor and that takes workload off of the main Mesa processor and that's part of how this system is faster in operation than the STAR. This is the PC emulation board. And it's hardware emulation. Um, you can see right here. Hopefully, we have another Intel 80186. The smaller connector for the backplane because this is on the 186 bus. And uh, the rest that's on here is just some glue logic and stuff. It's just the processor. When you're in emulation mode, it uses the main system memory and disk, and it emulated disk by file, uh, to run the PC function, but the processor itself is handled in hardware, so it does not slow the rest of the computer down when you are running PC emulation. Looking into the machine now, the connectors at the bottom are the 186 bus, and the ones at the top are for the Mesa bus. and then that small connector off to the side is what the PC emulation board hooks into. If we look in from the side a bit and the camera focuses you can see all of the memory chips on the memory expansion board. The reason that this system has a uh, kind of an odd amount of memory in it, 3.7 meg, is the first bit of memory lives on the display control board, or display control module, you know. Um, having the memory local to the display board helps it be faster, but the memory bus is one single address space, so the rest of the system memory lives on the uh, memory expansion board. Here on the bottom is where the hard drive lives. It is on a backplane connector though. You might notice all of these slots now, like these are labeled C1, C2, C3, this is C7, this is customer module 7, <laughs> the hard drive. This system has a uh, quantum Q540 a 40 megabyte MFM hard drive, full height. Uh, fortunately, this one does work. And you can see that uh, connector in there as well. With the hard drive removed, you can also now see the three cooling fans that uh, are in the bottom of the system. Those blow up uh, past the hard drive to cool the uh, cool the hard drive and the power supply and then also two on the side where all of the circuit boards are. This is all just a kind of common plenum down underneath. Air gets drawn in through vents here on the back and also through 
these vents on the side. The fans themselves are mounted in a uh, in a re removable tray, customer module eight. Let's look at the power supply. It is secured with a uh, single thumb screw. Again, that same type of connector. The power switch and reset button come out with it. Uh, let's see here. This this power supply was made in January 1986, and it is made by TRW of all people. Let's get a good look at the uh, at the labels there. There's the. Uh, there's the serial number of my system. And then all of these stickers are to capture the configuration of the system in some inscrutable scheme that Xerox came up with. And you enter that in the system configuration utility uh, when you were telling it about the system. For example, the uh, quantum hard drive you don't just tell it it's a 40 meg or it's a quantum, you tell it it's a 40 meg disk um, modification one. That's a quantum Q540. One other detail that's kind of nice is the adjustment for the power supply is accessible through even the trim cover on the back and all of these sockets are the exact size to grab onto a meter lead. So you can very easily test the outputs of the power supply and get it get it tuned up without um, having to disassemble the system which is good because since this is a backplane design it's kind of difficult to test any individual board running because you can't uh, it has to be plugged into the system sorry about any strobing um, this is the best I could get this adjusted. Uh, this monitor is uh, 40, or uh, excuse me, 37 hertz interlaced. Uh, so it's kind of difficult to get a uh, camera to sync to it. So here we are at the boot selection screen. Uh, you see the icons going across the bottom. You can see the system now has automatically picked a normal startup from the internal hard drive and we are now going to begin loading Viewpoint 2.0. What's actually happening right now is that we are resuming from Hibernate. Uh, the system has a function called Power Off Quick Restart where it saves the contents of RAM to the hard disk and then you can turn the system off. Uh, then when you turn it back on it just pumps the uh, data back into RAM. Uh, this takes the restart time down from, I don't know, on the order of 5-10 minutes to uh, just over a minute. Uh, if you look at my mouse cursor, well, you could see it there for a moment, uh, it's actually a series of four numbers. That's called the maintenance panel code and it tells you what state the system is in. Uh, that's a carryover from the star which had four seven segment LED displays on the front to show the maintenance panel code. They have that they called that whole thing on the front of the system the maintenance panel with the power switch and everything. So here we are at the login screen. I'm going to hit the keyboard and uh, we can go ahead and log in. Uh, since I've already signed into this system before my login name is cached. Note this bar at the top of the screen. That is not a menu bar, it is an information bar. And it uh, is telling me to enter my password and then press next. Which I will do. The system is now going to go out over the network, verify that that is still my password, and get me connected to the uh, copy of my profile here on the, uh, on the disk. And here we are. We are now within 
viewpoint. <clears throat> so this, uh, you know, kind of empty space. You know, this is our desktop. There's a number of uh, documents and things here on the screen. Uh, I guess a good place to start is the directory. The directory contains all the resources for a viewpoint. So you can see within the directory, at the very start we have three nodes, a workstation, desktop, and because we have the full network system install, network. Let's start in workstation. This contains things uh, re directly related to the workstation. Uh, the loader is, uh, think of it like a, the package manager kind of software and fonts, etc., that you want to be able to use in the system get copied into the loader, and then within the loader, you tell them to run. We'll look at that later. PC emulation contains the template for the PC emulator, the uh, emulated hard drive, and a blank uh, virtual floppy diskette. Basic icons are the empty templates from which you create all of your documents. There is no file new on this system. You, you say we wanted to make a new folder, I'd select this folder I'd use the copy key and make a copy. And then if I want to rename it, I'll use the uh, edit or show properties key. This opens a, uh, another dialog and I can rename this um, whatever I want. When I click that, you'll see the name change. So I'm going to go just move that out of the way for now. And the little icons help tell you what type of document the template is for. Local Devices has the uh, floppy drive, our uh, local serial port for doing communication. If we had a tape drive, that would also be in here. Office Accessories has our clock and our calculator. You might have noticed before the clock icon does show the uh, current time. And uh, terminal, em terminal emulators is like what it says. It's the terminal emulation software. We have a VT100 and a uh, TTY. Let's uh, get out of there. Desktop has things kind of more like your actual office desk. So we have our wastebasket to throw things away. We have, I have my mail inbox and an outbox. We also have my user profile that has various settings like if, um, for example, if I want, uh, where is it, invert display, yeah, invert screen, first option. We can set it to dark mode if we want. Uh, and it will store, if you change that in your user profile, it will then come up that way every time you log in. Now let's look at the network. Uh, I've got a, uh, an emulated server running and this is going out over regular Ethernet, it's plugged right into my regular home Ethernet network. And if I drill down to my emulated uh, organization here, <coughs> we now have three nodes, filing, printing, and TTY ports. Uh, TTY ports, the emulator lets me configure something as if it was a, a modem, and it'll actually go out and do Telnet. So you can take these and copy them into a terminal emulator, Oh, so you might notice to navigate up a level in this uh, filing window, you hit close. If I hit close all, it throws the whole window away. Within printing, we've got network printers. To use these, you just copy the icons to the desktop. And then filing has file servers. So you can drill down and here's a file drawer. And then these are all files on the file server. If you want, you can copy the individual file out, or there's a facility to create a uh, link, they call it a reference. And you can even choose what version of the file you want to reference. So it's got versioned filing.
and of course it keeps track of who modified it last um, and when. Let's, um, let's now take a look at email. Down in the corner of the screen I've got some icons related to mail. Here is my outbox which is used for sending mail and there's some options for verification. You can change the icon label. And then my inbox which is used for receiving mail. You can configure how often it will check for new messages which it just did and you notice the icon flash as it's configured here. If I cancel out of this you can see now my inbox has a letter in it so I've got new mail. Let's take a look. If I double click that the system is now going to get new mail and it should show up on the bottom of the list. There it is. And here is the new message. I can double click to open or I could click the display button and here is a message uh, reminding me yes be sure the camera is in focus that's a uh, that's a good uh, a good thing to do so if I resize this do we get more buttons yes um, when windows are too small to show all of the buttons at the top it just starts cutting them off I'm going to hit the answer button to this to reply. Notice it made a uh, an empty template icon for me down there in the corner. Let me drag this to where you can see it. And now I've got my subject in reply to So I've typed my message, I can hit send, sending, and your mail was sent. So I close my inbox now, notice the new mail icon is gone. Notice too that the form that I used to have that new message is still here on the desktop, it didn't go away. Um, like everything in viewpoint, everything is an object and we can copy an object with the copy key or we can move an object. If I take this and instead move it to my outbox we get the same thing and then when I click start it will send it again and now the icon is gone. If I want to get rid of this one I can take it and move it to my wastebasket. This view also gives a better uh, closer-up view. You can see the clock icon uh, ticking away. Within the mail window, the new mail icon um, is not for generating a new email message. It's for checking for new mail. And if I didn't want any of the, you know, a message, you can discard it. And then there is a, are you sure, up in the uh, information bar, which you couldn't see. So that is a quick demo of mail in viewpoint. It's actually kind of hard to film this uh, large monitor. It's uh, actually higher resolution than the camera that I'm using right now. Um, let's look at the PC emulator. I'll open it up. There is a dialog here which we can configure our floppy drive configuration. I'm telling it that we have, we're mapping the physical floppy drive on the system to floppy drive 1. We have a hard drive. We want to boot from it. We have a monochrome screen. We do want the mouse to be transferred through. So I'm going to go ahead and click Start.
and now the PC emulator is running and you can see we started up just like a regular DOS machine um, we can uh, fire up notepad if we want probably the worst way to edit documents on the uh, Xerox, but it does show that the mouse passes through into this uh, other environment. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's uh, let's uh, mount a virtual floppy drive. To do that, you take your floppy disk icon, you use the move key on the keyboard, and you move it to the floppy drive, and that inserts it and then to get rid of it you click in there and you can move it back onto the desktop. I'm going to go ahead and close this. Okay, now you can see at the top the information bar says, hey, you've got a machine running. If you close it, it's like turning the power off. I'll say yes. Let's open up one of these graphic transfer documents. Just transfers. We can watch the system paint. It's kind of like uh, this is clip art you could purchase from Xerox. Um, what else is in here? Nature. This little evil teddy bear. and a frog with big lips, what every professional office needs. Um, let's see here. What some of this other stuff is on here. Uh, this is a document. They, there's another template that has a bunch of uh, fancy letters. And note that so first of all, we're not in edit mode. If I go to start typing, it'll say this document is read-only. So if I click edit, now I can modify this document. And I am curious what font this is here at the beginning. Oh, do -do -do -do. Um, so if we go to properties of the character, let's instead say that's 18. Okay. Oh, I see. Show non-printing characters is on. So this system has a bunch of hamburger menus. There's one here for the overall system. That's where the invert screen option lives. Uh, date and time will show the current date and time, etc. Over here, I can say don't show structure, don't show non-printing. Okay. I also don't understand on this, when you set the font to like 18 point, it doesn't adjust the line size correctly. You end up having to say the line height is bigger, because otherwise it cuts the tops of the letters off. Yeah. So let's say we wanted to take this frame, graphics frame, which contains these letters. Let's see, I want to stretch it. Let's make it a little bit taller. And then we can. Oh, I want to move that. I 
I'm sure the kerning is not exactly correct now, but that's okay. Um, if I wanted to take this whole business and put it up into here, you'd think I could just select it, hit the move key, uh, indicated destination, and if I click it, nothing seemed to happen. I'm like, wait, what? And if I try and do it again, move, it'll say, cannot move selection to that location. What? And, you know, it looks like, continue typing, things seem fine. Um, you begin a selection with a left click and end a selection with a right click. You can go in here, let's say this is now uh, justified text instead. That'll look more. Um, the system doesn't always automatically repaginate. Uh, in one of these, there is an option to paginate. And if we do that, then it will show that graphics frame back where we expected it to be, where I moved it. And so you can see how that took it a moment. I guess that's why it doesn't do it immediately when you move a file. But in any event, that, uh, that took me quite a while to figure out with viewpoint. Like, I've moved it. What's going on? I don't understand. Um, we can save our current progress with this save and edit button. and it lets us continue editing. If we just click save, <coughs> we actually exit edit mode. And now this, the document is, uh, is read only. If I wanted to email this document, I take it and copy it to my outbox. And I'm gonna send this to a distribution list. And my note says, here is the And if I hit start, it will now send that out to the email distribution list. Notice the little info bar at the top grew to display uh, both lines, which says sending mail and mail test document was sent. Let's take a look in the loader. So, each software package that this system has is listed in the loader. Uh, in a way, you can kind of think of it like how um, Next and macOS do it, where programs and data are assembled into a package. And so you can see in here we've got remote printing is software that's running, the document editor, editor is software that's running. If I hit the uh, properties key on one of these, <coughs> it gives us the details and you can see it's set to auto run. It shows us the disk size in pages, you know that's a big one. Uh, each page is about 512k. And to load things into software into Viewpoint, you take it from one of the installation media and copy it into the loader. And to remove items, you would just click on them and press the delete key. Uh, if something is not running, so let's pick something that's not running, keyboard accelerator, uh, you can hit the run key. I bet this will not start because it has a dependency that it is not installed. Maybe it is going to run. Done. Okay. I actually don't know what that does. Version 2. Okay. Uh, so that's the loader. Let's now look at the uh, software options tool. Inside of here, 
is all of the software which this system is licensed for. Each box is filled in that, that it's licensed for and you've got all of the various categories of software that it knows about including things like um, all the fonts. Bold is a licensed feature on this system. You must pay to use bold. The little clock on the desktop that's in accessories I think is what it's called in here. V Viewpoint Office Accessories. That is a separately licensed feature. You have to pay for the little clock in the calculator. Uh, Xerox very much liked having their uh, licensing and recurring costs. Um, normally what you would do is you'd have a floppy diskette that had the keys on it and you put it in the system, hit this software options floppy and it would let you take one of the keys from the disk and load it on the system and then if you were done with the software on the system you could load the key back on the disk. Uh, fortunately somebody found a master password that allows you to go in and enable a bunch of features. They are time, the passwords are time sensitive so you have to set the clock to December 1997 but then once the system is activated it, it stays activated. Just for giggles now let's look at the freehand drawing application. This is a uh, this is a bitmap editor. So we get a line tool. So I can start my line. I can say where I want it to end. And then I say where I want excuse me what that is, let's do it this way. So you click to begin. Excuse me, I did that wrong again. You click where you want it, you drag where you want the arc to go to, and then you release you click again to say where you want the end of the line to be. Very different. The, uh, it's got this copy screen button which is a screenshot function so if I do a little screenshot of my PC icon notice my tool changed into a stamp and now I have a stamper of my PC icon and if I left click I can make stamps with it and if I right click it erases with it and it also um, when you pick the uh, the texture it uh, applies it to the stamp kind of amusing and you can hold it down like a brush that out. I think I'll do a separate video on actual document editing and do that from an emulator window so the screen is as clear as possible. Um, there is one other important thing that I should show and that's how this system separates the noun and the verb with mouse actions and which is different than most other systems. Unlike most systems, where you would say click and drag, on this system you select an icon, you use the move key on the keyboard, and then indicate the destination. Same with copy. These hard keys are your verbs. Let me show you a bit how that works. So within viewpoint on the desktop, there is no click and drag. If I just click one of these icons, like notice how it just stays selected. That's just ends up being what I'm selecting to open. If I want to move one of these on the desktop, I have to select it and then I'll push the move key 
and notice the information bar says now please indicate destination and my mouse cursor has changed to an icon or to the, the pointer has changed to an icon like the document and I can click one of these push the move key and that's how I can move icons around on the desktop similarly I can click on one of these push the copy key please indicate a destination and now I'm making a copy of this file on the desktop note I can have two documents with the same name just like you can on your physical desktop uh, if I go to move the clock icon notice I do get a a little clock now instead and that's very different from other systems uh, I would encourage you to watch the demo I gave of an actual uh, star running this same software actually that was also running viewpoint uh, with the uh, Apple Lisa I'm gonna link link that here up in the corner hopefully that works and uh, even when I, when I was demoing this system uh, a couple weeks ago there were a few people who had repeated the comments saying of oh well yeah you know Apple stole all this stuff from Xerox no no that that's not that's not what happened um, Jobs and Apple got a demo of Smalltalk where they got to see that you could have a computer with a high resolution bitmap screen with a mouse pointer and with cut copy and paste and with that seed of wow this is possible they went on to do the Lisa now of course did some of the Xerox team go to work at Apple yes absolutely so I'm sure there's some transfer there but viewpoint is really a, a vision of the future designed by computer technologists at, at the peak of the ivory tower of what what should the office of the future be how should things work uh, done in the late 70s so this system is a glimpse of a future that never really materialized well I think that's it for this short demo of viewpoint if there are any specific questions you have about the system or you'd like to see me do an operation or compare it to something else let me know I'd uh, I'd be happy to uh, to show you um, I do realize you know it is kind of just uh, hey let's uh, let's have fun with spreadsheets but um, <laughs> as is the case with a lot of systems I'm interested in that is what it is so um, let's go ahead and turn the system off now if I go up to the the uh, hamburger menu I can click on end session or I guess select end session and we get a couple options my local desktop here this copy of everything that's on here I can choose to keep it on the hard drive I can delete it or I can say move it to my file server which is specified in my profile active queues that's things that are processing like if I was printing something there would be a little number up here in the corner and then we have this option for power off quick restart aka hibernate when I pick it notice it makes me come up here to the top caution do not power off or reset until maintenance panel code 938 or 939 is displayed. Have you read this caution? And if you have to click yes to continue. And now I can click on power off quick restart. I can hear the hard drive just writing sequentially. it says 0920 so we're not there yet can you see that yeah here I can zoom in on that maybe if it'll focus 
There we go. So we're waiting for 0938 or 0939. Normally, when you go to, oh, nearly there, 0939. And now we can power off. So there we have it. Um, 6085. Can now uh, can now go to sleep. I guess it is asleep. Well, as always, thanks for watching.